It's your emergency. Hello? I'd like to report a murder. Who's the victim? Muhammad. Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. I think he was poisoned. Is this a friend or relative? No, he's the prophet of Islam. And when was this? Well, it was almost 14 centuries ago, but don't you guys have like a cold case file or something? Not for that long ago. Not for that long ago. Listen, lady, do you have any clue how important this case is? I've got Sunnis telling me a Jewish woman poisoned him. I've got Shias telling me Aisha poisoned him. And I want to know who killed... Hello? She hung up. Guess I'll have to solve this one myself. Through a careful investigation of Islam's most trusted sources. By the way, to all my Muslim friends out there who've never bothered to read your most trusted sources, may I say in advance, moi ha ha. All right, I've gone through the Quran, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Sira literature, and I think I've finally solved the mystery of Muhammad's death. Can you imagine solving a 1,400-year-old murder mystery by carefully re-examining the evidence? That kind of makes me the ultimate cold case detective, doesn't it? Take that, J. Warner Wallace. Tracking this case was actually pretty straightforward. The Muslim sources tell us that Muhammad was poisoned. All we have to do is take everything we know about how Muhammad was killed and ask ourselves who would have killed him in that particular way. Police do this sort of thing every day. They match up a bullet with the gun that fired the bullet. They match up fingerprints with the person who left the fingerprints. They match up details of a crime with a criminal who has a certain MO. So to figure out who killed Muhammad, we just need to do a little profiling. The main difficulty we face here is that lots of people wanted to kill Muhammad. The pagans wanted to kill him for conquering their cities, smashing their idols, slaughtering their men, raping their women, and enslaving their children. Jews wanted to kill him for seizing their land, destroying their communities, slaughtering their men, raping their women, and enslaving their children. Christians wanted to kill him for threatening to conquer them. Men wanted to kill him. Women wanted to kill him. Old people wanted to kill him. Young people wanted to kill him. Muhammad made a lot of enemies. Fortunately, we can narrow down our list of suspects by ruling out people who would have killed Muhammad in some way other than poisoning. Certain killers like to strangle their victims. They're not going to use poison. Some people prefer knives. Some people set fires. Some people push their victims off cliffs. Colonel Mustard wouldn't poison anyone. He'd use a lead pipe in the ballroom. Interestingly, the Quran tells us how Allah would have killed Muhammad. We find Allah's MO, his preferred method of executing false prophets, in Surah 69, verses 44 to 46. According to the Quran, if Muhammad were to invent a false revelation, if he were to fabricate verses of the Quran, Allah would kill him by severing his aorta. The aorta is the artery that comes out of the left ventricle of your heart. It's also called the life artery. Let's look at four translations of Surah 69, verses 44 to 46, so we can get a clear idea of what the passage is saying. The Hilleli Khan translation reads, And if he, Muhammad, had forged a false saying concerning us, us is Allah because he's plural sometimes, we surely would have seized him by his right hand, or with power and might, and then we certainly would have cut off his life artery. And in parentheses, the translators add aorta. The Pictal translation declares, And if he had invented false sayings concerning us, we assuredly had taken him by the right hand and then severed his life artery. The Sahih International translation reads, And if he, i.e. Muhammad, had made up about us some false sayings, we would have seized him by the right hand, then we would have cut from him the aorta. M.H. Shakir renders these verses, And if he had fabricated against us some of the sayings, we would certainly have seized him by the right hand. Then we would certainly have cut off his aorta. And just so we're clear on the meaning and no one accuses me of misrepresenting the passage, let me read one of the most popular Muslim commentaries on these verses. This is Tafsir Zalalain. 
And had he, namely the prophet, fabricated any lies against us by communicating from us that which we had not said, we would have assuredly seized him. We would have exacted vengeance against him as punishment by the right hand, by our strength and power. Then we would have assuredly severed his life artery, the aorta of the heart, a vein that connects with it, and which, if severed, results in that person's death. So, if Muhammad had been a false prophet, a liar, a deceiver, a fraud, a phony, a cheat, a con artist, we know how Allah would have killed him. Allah would have severed his aorta. As long as no one severs Muhammad's aorta, then, we can rule out Allah as a suspect. Now that we've got our methodology, let's turn to the Muslim sources so we can piece together a profile of Muhammad's murderer. According to Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and other texts, Muhammad was poisoned by a Jewish woman. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2617. A Jewess brought a poisoned cooked sheep for the Prophet who ate from it. She was brought to the Prophet and he was asked, Shall we kill her? He said, No. Anas added, I continued to see the effect of the poison on the palate of the mouth of Allah's messenger. People could see the effect of the poison in Muhammad's mouth. The poison apparently disfigured his palate, making his mouth look strange. Sahih Muslim 5705. It was narrated from Anas that a Jewish woman presented some poisoned lamb to the messenger of Allah and he ate some of it. She was brought to the Messenger of Allah, and he asked her about that. She said, I wanted to kill you. He said, Allah will never give you the power to do that. Or he said, to me, Allah will never give you the power to do that to me. They said, shall we kill her? He said, no. He said, this is honest, and I continued to see its effects on the uvula of the Messenger of Allah. Notice two things here. One, Muhammad tells this woman, Allah will never give you the power to kill me. I guess Muhammad didn't know Allah very well because, as we're about to see, the poison ultimately did kill him. Two, Anas could see the effects of the poison on Muhammad's uvula. That's the part that hangs at the back of your throat. So, when Muhammad opened his mouth, his companions could see, on the roof of his mouth all the way back towards the uvula, the damage caused by the poison. In case you're wondering why this woman wanted to poison Muhammad, she tells us in Ibn Sa'd, volume 2, page 252. The Apostle of Allah sent for Zainab bin al-Harith, that's the woman who poisoned him, and said to her, What induced you to do what you have done? She replied, You have done to my people what you have done. You have killed my father, my uncle, and my husband. So I said to myself, If you are a prophet, the foreleg will inform you. And others have said, if you are a king, we will get rid of you. The woman poisoned Muhammad because he slaughtered her father, her uncle, and her husband. That isn't motive. I don't know what is. So Muhammad slaughtered her family, and she retaliated by poisoning him. Open and shut case, right? Wrong. Because there's a plot twist here, my friends. You see, Zainab didn't act alone. She had a partner, an accomplice, a co-conspirator, someone working behind the scenes, pulling the strings, a mastermind so brilliant and diabolical he can only be described as the best of plotters. Let's see if we can unmask the true architect of the plot to murder Muhammad. Sahih al-Bukhari, 4428. Narrated Aisha, the prophet in his ailment in which he died used to say, O oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaibar, and at this time I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. What's that, Muhammad? Something about your aorta being cut? That's strange. I seem to recall someone telling us that if he were going to kill you for being a false prophet, he'd do it by severing your aorta. I should also point out that the words as if are not in the Arabic. They were added by the translator. Muhammad simply says, I feel my aorta being cut from that poison. But let's keep reading. Sunan Abu Dawud 4498. 
The hadith starts with some text about Muhammad receiving presents. Then we have, this version adds, So a Jewess presented him, Muhammad, at Kaibar with a roasted sheep, which she had poisoned. The messenger of Allah ate of it, and the people also ate. He then said, Take away your hands from the food, for it has informed me that it is poisoned. Bishr ibn al-Bara ibn Marur al-Ansari died. So he, the prophet, sent for the Jewess and said to her, What motivated you to do the work you have done? She said, If you were a prophet, it would not harm you. But if you were a king, I should rid the people of you. The Messenger of Allah then ordered regarding her, and she was killed. He then said about the pain of which he died, I continued to feel pain from the morsel which I had eaten at Kaibar. This is the time when it has cut off my aorta. This is the time when it has cut off my aorta. Didn't someone tell us in the Quran that he would kill Muhammad by cutting off his aorta? By the way, if you're wondering why some passages say that Muhammad let Zainab live while other passages say that he executed her, scholars harmonize the passages by saying that Muhammad initially allowed her to live, but that once Bishr died, he had her executed. Speaking of Bishr, notice the passage says that Muhammad's companion Bishr died from eating the poison. Interestingly, before Bishr died, he told Muhammad that as soon as he put the poisoned lamb in his mouth, he could taste the poison. But he ate it anyway, because he saw Muhammad eating it. Ibn Sa'd, Volume 2, pages 251 to 252. Then the Apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, said, Come closer and have a night meal. The Apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, took the foreleg, a piece of which he put into his mouth. Bishr ibn al bara took another bone and put it into his mouth. When the Apostle of Allah, blah, 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 ate one morsel of it, Bishr ate his, and other people also ate from it. Then the Apostle of Allah, blah, 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 said, Hold back your hands, because this foreleg, and according to another version, the shoulder of the goat, has informed me that it is poisoned. Thereupon Bishr said, By him who hath made you great, I discovered it from the morsel I took. Nothing prevented me from emitting it out, spitting it out, but the idea that I did not like to make your food unrelishing. When you had eaten what was in your mouth, I did not like to save my life after yours, and I also thought you would not have eaten it if there was something wrong. Bisher did not rise from his seat, but his color changed to that of Telsan, a green cloth. Bishr turned green and died because he trusted Muhammad. Muhammad died too. His pain and sickness just lasted much longer. In Sunan Abu Dawud, Muhammad even described his pain to Bishr's mother. Sunan Abu Dawud, 4499. Narrated Ibn Kab Ibn Malik on the authority of his father, Umm Mubashir, Bishr's mother, said to the Prophet during the sickness of which he died, what do you think about your illness, Messenger of Allah? I do not think about the illness of my son except the poisoned sheep of which he had eaten with you at Kaibar. The Prophet said, And I do not think about my illness except that. This is the time when it cut off my aorta. There's that aorta again. The History of At-Tabari, Volume 8, page 124. The Messenger of God said during the illness from which he died, the mother of Bishr ibn al bara had come in to visit him, Um Bishr, at this very moment I feel my aorta being severed because of the food I ate with your son at Kaibar. Okay, Muhammad, we got the point about your severed aorta. According to Aisha, Muhammad was in total agony before his death. Sunan ibn Majah, 1622. Aisha said, I never saw anyone suffer more pain than the Messenger of Allah. He was in so much pain that he couldn't even walk on his own. His followers had to drag him around. Sahih al Bukhari, 2588. Narrated Az Zuri, Ubaidullah bin Abdullah told me that Aisha had said, When the Prophet became sick and his condition became serious, 
He requested his wives to allow him to be treated in my house, and they allowed him. He came out leaning on two men while his feet were dragging on the ground. He was walking between Al-Abbas and another man. Well, he wasn't really walking if his feet were dragging on the ground while two guys propped him up. I guess we know where they got the plot for Weekend at Bernie's. Now, since the Quran says that if Muhammad were a false prophet, Allah would sever his aorta, and Muhammad eventually admitted that he could feel his aorta being severed, you might think we have a pretty good reason to reject Muhammad and his revelations. But you're wrong. If you look more closely, you'll see that we have at least 10 good reasons to reject Muhammad and his revelations. First, think about Muhammad's argument in the Quran. If I'm a false prophet, Allah will cut my aorta. People who make silly claims like this usually aren't prophets. Hi, I'm a prophet. If I'm not, may God strike me down with lightning. Oh, no lightning? You see, this proves I'm a prophet. Now, give me your daughters. God wants you to give me your daughters. When someone uses that kind of reasoning, chances are he's a false prophet. But that's exactly how Muhammad argues in Surah 69. Second, even though these God will strike me down claims are usually enough to spot a false prophet, I believe that God sometimes makes things even more clear and obvious for us. If someone's running around saying, I'm a true prophet because God didn't strike me down, God might ignore him. But in some cases, God might decide to thoroughly disgrace and humiliate him. And if any false prophet in history was a candidate for divine judgment, it was Muhammad. Now, Surah 69 was a Meccan surah, an early revelation, meaning that Muhammad was reciting this to his followers for years. He spent years telling his companions, if I'm a false prophet, God's going to sever my aorta. My friends, there are thousands of ways to die. Do you really think it's a coincidence that Muhammad died in exactly the way his so-called revelations said he would die if he's a deceiver and a false prophet? Looks like divine judgment to me. Third, I don't want to call Muhammad stupid, because that wouldn't be politically correct, but let's think about this for a moment. Muhammad and his followers attack Kaibar. After the Muslims kill a bunch of men and rape a bunch of women, standard practice for Muhammad and his companions, a Jewish woman comes up to Muhammad. Muslims had slaughtered all the men in her family, and she offers to cook dinner for Muhammad and his band of merry murderers. And Muhammad accepts her offer. Sure, I love lamb. So nice of you to cook dinner for us after we butchered your father and your husband. Look, if Muhammad doesn't have enough common sense to realize that he probably shouldn't eat that lamb, why should we trust anything that comes out of his mouth? If a woman comes up to you and says, Hi, you slaughtered my family. Care for a delicious meal? And the only response you can think of is, Yeah, I sure am hungry. Sorry, you're not a real prophet. Fourth, despite the fact that Muslims had slaughtered her family, the Jewish woman, Zainab, was actually open to the possibility that Muhammad was a prophet. She gave him the poison as a test. If he were a true prophet, he wouldn't eat it. If he were a false prophet, he'd die. Since Muhammad died from the poisoning, he failed Zainab's test. Fifth, Muhammad's companion Bishr could taste the poison as soon as he put the lamb, or depending on the source, the goat, in his mouth. Why did he keep eating? He told us he kept eating because he believed in Muhammad. There's no way this lamb is poisoned. Muhammad's eating it, and he's the prophet. Bishr's faith in Muhammad got him killed. Now, I'm willing to lay this down as a rule. If I can't trust you with my dinner, I definitely can't trust you with my salvation. If you can't figure out what's waiting for you in your food, how could you possibly know what's waiting for you in the afterlife? Sixth, when Zainab told Muhammad that she was trying to kill him, Muhammad said that Allah would never allow it. But Allah did allow it. So if Muhammad was wrong about Allah then, please explain to me why I should trust him when he tells me other things about Allah. Seventh, Muhammad claimed that the lamb he was eating spoke to him and told him that it was poisoned. So, 
He got a special revelation because he was a prophet. Two questions. One, why didn't the roasted lamb say something five minutes earlier which would have saved Muhammad's life, not to mention Bishr's life? And two, why did Muhammad need a revelation when the lamb literally tasted like poison? Bishr said he could taste the poison. But when Muhammad took a bite of the food that tasted like poison, he suddenly got a revelation just a little too late? Isn't this proof that Muhammad was actually making up revelations? Isn't it obvious that he tasted the poison, same as Bishr? But instead of saying, hey, I taste poison, he said, it's speaking to me. I'm a prophet. Sounds like a man who was fabricating revelations. And what did Allah say he would do to Muhammad for fabricating revelations? Allah said that he would sever Muhammad's aorta. Eighth, think about the justice here. The justice is a little too poetic. This can't be coincidence. Muhammad did more than anyone else in history to provoke hatred against Jews. Muhammad did more than anyone else in history to oppress women. Muhammad told his followers that women are stupid. And then Muhammad died a miserable, humiliating, agonizing, wretched death after being outwitted by a Jewish woman. So God didn't merely disgrace Muhammad by severing his aorta, thereby identifying him as a false prophet. God added to Muhammad's humiliation and degradation by severing his aorta through the hands of a Jewish woman seeking vengeance against the man who had brought her community nothing but death, torture, and rape. Ninth, according to the Quran, when the Jews tried to kill Jesus, Allah intervened and rescued him. This is what Allah claims in Surah 4, verses 157 to 158. Allah took Jesus safely to paradise. He wouldn't give anyone the victory over Jesus. But when a group of Jews wants to kill Muhammad, what happens? Allah sits back and watches as a woman poisons his prophet and sends his prophet to a humiliating, agonizing death. Why does Allah protect Jesus from harm, zips him straight to paradise? But then, when he turns around and sees Muhammad wallowing in freakish misery, he doesn't lift a finger to help him. Sounds like Allah was showing a little favoritism. Don't mess with Jesus because Allah won't let you. But go ahead and feed Muhammad some rat poison because Allah just doesn't care. Finally, Muhammad's greatest wish was to die in battle. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, Muhammad declares, By him in whose hands my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause, and then come back to life, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred. If you read the Muslim sources, you know that every time Muhammad wants something, Allah gives him a special revelation, granting him whatever he desires. Muhammad wants to have sex with his best friend's daughter. Allah gives him a revelation. Muhammad wants more than four wives. Allah gives him a revelation. Muhammad wants the wife of his own adopted son. Allah gives him a revelation. Allah is Muhammad's wish-granting genie in a bottle who's got nothing to do but sit around all day making Muhammad's sexual fantasies come true. Muhammad's ultimate wish was to die in battle. He was obsessed with martyrdom. But instead of letting Muhammad die while fighting the Jews, Allah lets him die a disgraceful death in utter agony at the hands of a Jewish woman? Death by leg of lamb? After spending more than two decades granting Muhammad anything he wanted, Allah suddenly decides not to give Muhammad what he wanted most? Seems Allah had a change of heart. This bothered Muslims so much that they started saying Muhammad was a martyr because he was poisoned by a woman whose family he had slaughtered. The problem here is that when Muhammad said he wanted to be martyred, he was clearly talking about dying in battle, not about being poisoned and feeling Allah severing his aorta. Putting all of this together, we have at least 10 reasons to reject Islam just by examining how Muhammad died. If we look at how Muhammad lived, of course, we have another trillion or so reasons to conclude that he's the most obvious false prophet in history. But how do Muslims respond to the fact that their prophet died exactly how Allah said he would die if he was fabricating revelations? Well, 
most Muslims never have to respond because they don't know about any of this. They don't know what Allah said in Surah 69. They don't know what's in Bukhari. They don't know what's in Sahih Muslim. They don't know what's in Sunan Abu Dawud. They don't know what's in Tabari. They don't know what's in Ibn Sa'd. Their leaders hide this from them. You can line up a thousand Muslims and ask them about their prophet being poisoned and complaining about his aorta being severed. And if even one Muslim in a thousand knows about this, it's because he heard it from me. Under no circumstances did he hear this from his sheikhs and imams. Imagine a religion where the followers of the religion only learn the truth about the prophet of the religion from people who don't follow the religion because the scholars of the religion keep the followers of the religion in a state of ignorance. Now, when Muslims do hear about this, again, always from us, they only have five basic responses. One, they say that Muhammad couldn't have died from the poison because he died three years after he was poisoned. They say, ha ha, what kind of idiot thinks that a person can die three years after he swallows some poison? And that's when we point out that their prophet was the one who said he was dying from the poison. Muhammad said to Bishr's mom during the illness from which he died, at this very moment, I feel my aorta being severed because of the food I ate with your son at Kaibar. So, if it's stupid and idiotic and moronic to think that a person can die three years after swallowing some poison, then Muhammad is the stupid, idiotic moron here. Never forget, no one insults Muhammad like his followers do. The other problem with this response is that various poisons can kill you years after you swallow them. Ask any doctor. Let's say that one gram of some poison is enough to kill you quickly. What if you take a little less than a gram? Well, it might cause internal damage to your palate and esophagus and organs. You might survive a long time with this internal damage, but you can eventually die from the complications. So, when Muslims say it makes no sense for Muhammad to survive three years after eating the poison, they're contradicting science and their own prophet. Two, and this is going to sound insanely stupid, but I assure you that it's one of their main responses, Muslims point out that there are two different words for the aorta in these passages. And it's the same in English. In English, we can call it the aorta or the life artery. But Muslims will claim that since these passages use two different words for aorta, Muhammad saying that he could feel his aorta being severed has nothing to do with Allah saying that he would sever Muhammad's aorta for fabricating revelations. Why is this ridiculous? Well, suppose I announce to the world that I'm a prophet. One day I say, if I'm lying, God will strike me down by drowning me in a pool of H2O. Then years later, as I'm drowning in a pool, I say, oh no, I'm drowning in a pool of water. My critics would obviously say that's exactly what David said would happen if he was a false prophet. Imagine my followers replying, not at all. This proves nothing. David said he would die in a pool of H2O, but he died in a pool of water. These are two different terms for water, so it's not the same thing. But it is the same thing. Allah said that he would sever Muhammad's aorta for fabricating revelations. Muhammad died saying that he could feel his aorta being severed. That's a problem. Deal with it. Three, Muslims will insist, without any evidence to back it up, that severing the aorta is some sort of idiom that refers to dying, perhaps with a lot of chest pain. But this is completely irrelevant. If you want to say that severing Muhammad's aorta doesn't literally mean severing Muhammad's aorta, but instead refers to something else, fine. Whatever you say the phrase means, it's what Allah said would happen to Muhammad for fabricating revelations, and it's exactly what happened to Muhammad. Four, when we point out that Muhammad died in exactly the way the Quran said he would die if he fabricated revelations, Muslims say that we're actually affirming that Muhammad was a true prophet. If we take Surah 69, 44 through 46 seriously, we must be asserting that it's a true revelation. 
and therefore that Muhammad was a true prophet, at least for a while. But we're not saying this at all. In fact, I already addressed this earlier. If I stand up and say, I'm a true prophet, and God will strike me with lightning if I'm lying, and then I get struck by lightning, this doesn't mean I was delivering a true revelation when I said that God would strike me down. It would only mean that God saw what I said and decided to completely, utterly, totally humiliate and expose me. No true revelations required. Five, there's always the two quoque fallacy. Muslims will say, so what if Muhammad died an agonizing death? Jesus did too, which is strange because I thought that in Islam, Allah rescued Jesus from dying. In reality, of course, Jesus did die an excruciating death on the cross. But notice, Christians have never hid this, unlike Muslims who've spent so many centuries covering up how their prophet died that you can spend your entire life without meeting a Muslim who knows about it. And let's not forget that in Christianity, there's a reason for Jesus' death. It's foundational to Christianity. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. There's a point to it. What's the point of Muhammad dying in total agony in exactly the way Allah said he would die if he fabricated revelations? See the difference? So, there's just no way around this problem. The Quran said that Allah would sever Muhammad's aorta if he fabricated revelations, and Muhammad died saying that he could feel his aorta being severed. In the Muslim sources, we even find Muhammad admitting that he fabricated revelations. After the infamous Satanic Verses incident, where Muhammad told his followers that they could pray to three pagan goddesses, Muhammad confessed in the History of At-Tabari, Volume 6, page 111, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. How could Muhammad make it any more obvious that he was a false prophet? Think about how simple this is. Allah says in the Quran, and if he had fabricated against us some of the sayings, we would certainly have seized him by the right hand. Then we would certainly have cut off his aorta. Muhammad says in the history of At-Tabari, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. Then he says in Sunan Abu Dawud, this is the time when it has cut off my aorta. How could this be any simpler. What I find most interesting in all of this is that when I show Muslims what their sources say, they don't get mad at Muhammad for deceiving them. They don't get mad at their sources for embarrassing them. They don't get mad at their scholars for hiding this information from them. They get mad at me for telling them the truth and showing them what's in their sources. They get mad at me for making a video about what really happened to their prophet. They get mad at me for criticizing the most obvious false prophet in history. But let me be perfectly clear. Nothing I've said about Muhammad in this video or anywhere else comes close to what God said about Muhammad. I'll go a step further. If you take everything that people have ever said or done to insult Muhammad, Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses, the Danish cartoons, Charlie Hebdo, Islamicize Me, Muhammad's Boom Boom Room, AP's videos. If you take all of our criticisms and mockery of Muhammad and roll it all up into one big ball, it's nothing compared to what God did to Muhammad, according to the Muslim sources. There's no comparison between some guy drawing a picture of Muhammad and God severing his aorta to humiliate and degrade and expose him. God is the ultimate critic of Muhammad. So, what are you going to do, my Muslim friends? Are you going to run around calling God an Islamophobic bigot because he insulted your fake prophet? Or are you going to accept correction from the Almighty? Islam means submission. You Muslims think it refers to submission to God. But God has already given his answer. He commands you to reject Muhammad. 
If you continue believing in Muhammad, what you're really saying is, even God can't make me stop believing in Muhammad. Because we don't care what God says. We only care about Muhammad. But in that case, Islam isn't submission to God. It's submission to Muhammad. And if you care more about submitting to Muhammad than you care about submitting to God, you guys are living in Shirk Central. <laughs> Yeah, yeah.